Have you ever heard the aphorism, the saying, that you can't pour from an empty cup? Or you can't pour from an empty pitcher? Or you can't pour from an empty vessel? That saying has become the rallying cry for a self-care movement that has sprung up among a people who are just exhausted, burned out, disillusioned. It's become a rallying cry among people who are working more than they used to, where both parents are having to hold down jobs to be able to keep their family at somewhere near middle-class life in the United States of America. It's the rallying cry of people who are running their children around to various sports and practices of other kinds. It is the rallying cry for a people that are constantly trying to posture, constantly trying to show themselves to be worthy of the company of their neighbors. This cry, you can't pour from an empty pitcher, has some wisdom to it. There is a way of responding as Christians to that rallying cry that strikes me as kind of cruel, actually. That response among some Christians to the idea that you can't pour from an empty pitcher goes something like this. You know, if Jesus was able to die on the cross for you, or if St. Paul was able to allow himself to be poured out as a drink offering on behalf of the gospel, then the very least you can do is keep up with the rat race of your pitiful life. Ah, Christianity, we have so much work to do in re-credentialing ourselves and the gospel in a society that has written us off as bitter, mean, judgmental people. I hope that that will not be your response to someone who says you can't pour from an empty pitcher. There has to be room in our life for relaxation, for rest, for refreshment, for pleasure. It is totally unrealistic to compare the daily grind of postmodern life to the martyrdom of the saints in the past. Just in case you ever have the opportunity to lay down your life in cause to the gospel, trust me, you should do that. But that is not the same thing as the daily grind that is grinding so many of us and the people around us down and down and down. So I don't want us to respond with that kind of Christian cruelty. Instead, I think there is a way that we can think about what it might mean to refill that vessel, refill our cups, refill our pitchers, refill ourselves. But the, the key, I will posit in Jesus' name, is not just rest, relaxation, refreshment, and pleasure. Though those are wonderful and hallowed things. I mean, come on, folks. Sabbath is in the DNA of our religion. It is sacred to rest. But when people are pouring out, I have to be careful or it looked like I wet my pants during the sermon. But when we are pouring out in service to our families, the people we love, in service to our neighbors for whom we may not feel uh, emotional love, and in service to our congregation, I want to suggest to you that rest, relaxation, and pleasure will not fill you back up. 
it, it certainly has benefits. It has benefits for your body. It has benefits for your relationships. It has benefits for your mental health. No question. But I want to tell you, from what I am seeing, when people live by that motto, you can't pour from an empty pitcher, what they're actually doing is they're just pausing the pouring out of themselves for those around them. They're not actually getting filled back up. This morning's gospel speaks to what could actually fill us back up. Jesus goes to the home of Martha, and Martha, being a good hostess, decides that it is her responsibility, like Sarah in our Genesis reading, to lay out a spread out of respect for the rabbi, to be hospitable to the guest in her home. So she is busy, busy, busy. And that good-for-nothing sister of hers, Mary, is just sitting and visiting with Jesus. I'm sure you've all done this kind of thing where you have people over to your house and then you spend all your time in the kitchen while they're out uh, in the living room or whatever trying to figure out what to do them with themselves and you miss the chance for the fellowship that you invited them for in the first place. Something similar happens at Martha's home. Dr. Luke, by sharing this story, is in no way, shape, or form trying to tell us that servanthood, feeding is bad or wrong or even inferior. It is not. Remember, the one who tells us the story of the Good Samaritan, which we heard last week, which prioritized servanthood to the world around us, calls us to be neighbors to the world around us. Surely the one who tells that tale would not then say to us, servanthood is worthless or inferior. Instead, what this story from the gospel is telling us is that servanthood without something more is like pouring yourself out and eventually your pitcher will be empty. And as I have had the opportunity to interact with so many of you who have a servant's heart, there is a growing exhaustion, there's maybe some resentment. There's maybe some disillusionment. But you keep soldiering on because that's what Protestants do. Mary has a reminder for those of us who are drawn into friendship with Jesus that the way to get our pictures filled is not just rest, relaxation, and pleasure. The way to get our pitcher refilled is religion. Religion does something for the human being that rest cannot. Hear that. Religion does something for the human being that rest cannot. Religion has the capacity to refill our pitcher. Jesus has all sorts of great imagery that he shares in the course of his ministry about being filled up. But that filling up that he promises us is not, uh, not kind of old-fashioned religion. It's not a bunch of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. It's not a bunch of ritual requirements as if we were practicing white witchcraft to make the Zeus do what we want them to do. Well, that's bubkus. Jesus disabuses the people of his time and this time of all of that performative religion. Instead, he invites us, like Mary, into a religion of relationship, a religion where we spend our time in friendship with the risen Christ. Jesus says... Uh, to the woman at the well. I can give you the water of life, and if you drink this water of life, it will create in you a spring that will gush up the water of eternal life. Jesus says, my friendship with you can 
fill you up in a way that will sate you forever. If we'll allow our Lord to mix his metaphors a bit, Jesus says to his buddies on the night that he is betrayed by one of his best friends, uh, that if you abide in me and I abide in you, my words, he says, abide in you, then you will be you will be fruitful. Your life will be fruitful. What you do will be worth it. It will actually happen. Jesus tells us that religion, relationship with him, is able to accomplish something that rest, relaxation, and pleasure cannot, as important and holy as those things are. So when we, as the body of Christ, talk about the fact that we have something to offer the world around us, that the world needs what we have, it is this. It is that relationship with Christ Jesus that fills us up so that indeed it is true that we can do all things through the one who strengthens us. Remember a few weeks back, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago already, I told you that you should go home to your Bibles, open up to the Gospels, and then randomly open to uh, uh, a part of the Gospels and point and find the nearest words of Jesus to your fingers. And that you should take those words and memorize them, write them on Post-its, Write them in on the mirror with your lipstick. Find some way to keep those words of Jesus in front of you. Uh, if you didn't do that, or if you haven't done it since, you should do that again. You should find a way for the words of Jesus to bump around on your insides, because that is how the relationship is created. That is the daily discipline that draws you into a life of worship, Formation in Jesus' timeless way, fellowship with your fellow Christians, and servanthood in the church and through the church, those things create the timeless life that Jesus promises us. But if you don't have that first step of friendship with him, if you aren't joining Mary by sitting at his feet and listening before you try to serve, then you will find that your religious experience feels like a habit, a good habit, but just a habit. You will feel as though you keep giving yourself away and you don't have much else to give. And those things will kill your soul. Rather than do that as if it were worth anything, accept Jesus' invitation to pause, to sit with Mary at his feet, to listen to his words, and to allow that to create a friendship that lasts forever and will change the way you live. Yes, even you. Uh, I, I, I'm serious, it, it can happen. I know we Protestants have thought to our, we've lost our confidence in religion's transformative possibility. Uh, it is possible. All things are possible in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.